Hi, everybody. My name is Jamie McLeod Skinner. I'm a proud rural Oregonian who believes in protecting our democracy and electing good leaders we can trust to serve all Oregonians, including our BIPOC community and rural Oregonians. Today, we're joined by Oregon State Treasurer Tobias Reed. The State Treasurer is a statewide elected office that serves as Chief Financial Officer for our state and is responsible for the management of billions of taxpayer dollars. Um, uh, Tobias Reed oversees the investment of state funds, uh, the issuing of state bonds, serves as the central bank for state agency, and administers the Oregon 529 Savings Network and the Oregon Retirement uh, Savings Plan. He also serves on the state land board and a number of uh, public financial boards, including the Oregon Investment Council and State Debt Policy Advisory Commission. Uh, Tobias Reed, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm excited to uh, to talk today, and uh, I really compliment your uh, your comprehensive and approachable description of the state treasurer's office. That uh, is not something that very many people can do so well. Oh, thank you. Well, um, it's also in folks not understanding your role and how important it is. I, I know that, that uh, especially when you're running for re-election, you don't get that much attention, get that many questions. So we've had some folks send in some questions. We um, we're, we're looking to, to ask you a bunch of questions today so people can learn more about you and about what you do and the important role that you're, you're serving in. Um, and especially in this time, as our economy struggles to bounce back from the impact of COVID-19, there's such a strong interest in what government can do to help our families and small businesses in urban and rural areas. Um, but before we jump into the mechanics of your office, um, let's start off by learning a little bit more about you as a person. So um, the knowledge about you for some folks, on Facebook at least, is limited to the fact that knowing that you're not very good at throwing an axe. Um, but apart from that, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks. It's true. I, I am not a natural axe thrower, but I uh, appreciate that reference to our, our campaign ad as an attempt to try and stand apart from the typical conversation a little bit. I was, uh, I was raised by, by parents who made it really clear to me that I had some, some responsibilities uh, to the community, that, that I was a beneficiary of people who had come before me and, and invested uh, in, in schools and libraries and soccer leagues and that sort of stuff. And um, they, they were just really clear about you have to figure out some way to, to try to pay that forward. And uh, politics ended up uh, being that way for me. But it wasn't uh, something that I, I knew from the start. I certainly did not imagine myself as a, as a candidate from the beginning, but I did have a good fortune to work for a number of other office holders and, and in campaigns and so on. And, and having been raised in, in Idaho, uh, I came to, uh, to Oregon to go to college. Fortunately, uh, landed at a great place right across uh, from the Capitol and worked in the legislature, uh, went on to work in the U.S. Treasury Department and go to graduate school in, in business. And uh, when I came back, um, I was uh, you know, really excited to, to try to bring those public, public sector and private sector lessons um, to the legislature, where for me, it was, uh, it was very much like being in college. The, the committees were sort of like classes and get to pick all of them myself, uh, but it did turn out to be a really great education education and uh, allowed me to develop some of the, the specialties that, that have, uh, have, have given me really great opportunities. And as part of that, I found myself working with, uh, with treasurers and with treasury staff. And so the opportunity to try to bring the lessons from the legislature into the, into the treasurer's office uh, was exciting to me. I ran four years ago and I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing uh, in the treasurer's office to, to try to bring our, our, um, our, our values as Oregonians to our financial obligations, um, to be consistent with our fiduciary responsibilities, uh, but to be able to have not only the, the opportunity, but the true responsibility to think about the long run. There's so much about our, our politics and our, our processes that really emphasizes the, the short term to the to the detriment of the long run. And the treasurer's office is one of those places where we get to think about not just the next quarter of the next year, but we have to think about decades into the future. And I found that really rewarding uh, and really exciting. And I'm looking forward to hopefully continuing to do that. Well, thanks for that. And um, as someone very focused on the work, you jump from the personal into the professional. So I appreciate you jumping ahead on that. But I want to ask you another uh, sure. question I like to ask a, a lot of folks who I talk to. And it's simply this, what uh, historical figure or leader um, inspires you and why? It's a it's a hard question because there are so many good examples, um, and I guess I point to to two people. One one that's pretty personal. My my dad and, and grandfather. Uh, my dad was a psychologist, and 
um, after he died, um, then I learned it's one of those one of the few jobs where you don't as a kid, I felt a little left out, you don't get to participate and take your child to work day uh, with, a, with a clinical psychologist. Um, but after he died, uh, we heard from a lot of people that he was helping um, without um, an ability to, to pay or to, you know, to be uh, a full participant in that sense. So, you know, the, the, the quiet commitment to service really lived in him. And I know he got that from his dad, my grandfather, who served as the deputy high commissioner for refugees in the in the UN uh, during the 1950s? So that that international uh, commitment has been has been strong uh, for a long time. But the historical figure, I thought I think about this a lot, and especially I, my answer to that would probably change based on the on the time and the and the environment. And there's plenty of of different examples. But uh, I've been listening. On a, on a regular basis for years to the, to the speech that John Kennedy gave uh, in Houston when he committed to going, going to the moon uh, without necessarily a specific idea about how to do that. But you'll remember that famous quote about choosing to go to the moon in this decade and, and to do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard, um, because they serve to organize and measure the best of our skills and abilities and those sorts of things. And um, you could really hear the, the passion, that little gravel that was in the hard with the Massachusetts accent. Um, and in a time like this, uh, with the leadership we don't see uh, out of the White House, I, I really long for that, um, that ability to summon the, 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 certainly the country and maybe the global community to a common mission and recognize that everybody has a role to play in that mission. So. Um, it is by no means uh, the case that I'm saying that he's the only guy worth looking at, but that's that's one message that I really hold on to right now. Um, and first of all, I did not know that about you with the, the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. So when I worked in Bosnia early in my career, repairing post-war, repairing schools and hospitals, we were implementing UNHCR funds. Uh. And so uh, uh, I'm very familiar with UNHCR. I didn't realize there was that, that connection. So that's really interesting. Uh, the other comment about um, Kennedy's statement and the travel to the moon and, and doing it because it's hard. We are very much in that time, yeah. uh, not going to the moon, but doing almost the equivalent within our own communities and, and addressing things like um, uh, structural um, inequities and, and, and institutionalized racism how can we establish that challenge and get people leaning into it and actually address go to the moon in a way we never have with our own communities and our own culture? Great question. I think one thing that, that really uh, provides an opportunity for that is, is an increasing recognition that it's not just the right thing to do on a moral basis, but it's in all of our own self-interest. There's a really strong case to be made that when we are more inclusive, when we are more equitable, all of us do better, even if our, our, our definition is so narrow as to be around finance or resilience or those sorts of things. There's just simply too many problems in the, in the country and in the world uh, to, to run any risk of leaving any talent off the field, um, to, to sort of mix metaphors. Um, we need everyone's best abilities and best talents. And when we're not doing that, it's, it's, it's undercutting our own case. So I think um, letting go of, um, of, of why someone could come to that conclusion opens the door a lot wider and, and lets more people come to the really obvious recognition when, when we think about it, that, that we want everybody to have a fair shot, to have the resources um, to be full participants and to live up to their very fullest potential. Um, I, yeah, I'm, 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 that might come up later again to kind of dig in a little sure. bit more to how we do that and the steps taken and really through your role in, in, in managing investments of our resources. I mean, there's that classic thing of put your money where your mouth is. So um, I, I'm going to come back to that a little bit Please. later. But, but one of the things that um, is near to, dear to my heart and to many Oregonians is um, addressing this urban rural divide that we see. And sometimes it's it's uh, more simplistically looked at a political divide, but but really this addressing uh, rural issues. So um, our, you know, my dear friends who, who serve in, in urban areas um, and do a great job in serving rural, uh, urban communities, sometimes don't have that on the ground understanding of, of what our experience in rural communities. And so um, I know from personal experience that relationships are important to you. That's something I've seen in you um, before we had folks listening to a live stream. That's something that's part and parcel for you. Yeah. Um, how, what's your take on the urban rural divide and what do you think we can do to better bridge that divide? I think about this a lot and, and 
it is definitely an issue. I think to some extent, um, this might be one of the few places uh, where where our, our strange revenue structure uh, actually serves as an advantage because a success in one part of the state is no less a success elsewhere because we really are uh, connected. And the simplest answer to all of this is it's showing up. Um, there's nothing more magic than that. Uh, I, this is one place where I had a real advantage having, having been raised in Idaho. I've made the drive many, 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 many times. I know it doesn't compare to all the, the miles that you put on your car uh, in, in Eastern Oregon, but showing up and, and going beyond that, it's not showing up to tell people how it is or how it should be. It's showing up to listen. And that is honestly one of the best things about being state treasurer. And, and you know, in the in the before times, I could do that in person, um, and I could show up and I could hear. And it, the role that I'm privileged to have uh, is not especially partisan. So I feel like it gives me a different entree into those conversations. I know we're going to talk about savings, for example. That's not a partisan thing. That's not Democrats or Republicans. That's math. That's the power of compound interest to say to somebody, I want you to have the tools to make your own choices with your own money. I haven't encountered anybody who, who's objected to that yet. But then, then we can have the conversation about what are their aspirations? What are their worries? And you know, I don't get to travel around as much right now for obvious reasons, but I do a lot more of these kinds of conversations and a lot more phone calls. And what I hear consistently is a level of anxiety um, around you know, keeping people for people keeping themselves healthy and safe around their businesses, employees, jobs, around their finances, and a feeling that um, they've been left out. Um, but that is not, and this is an important point, that is not something that is particular to a geographic location. It's true everywhere. And that recognition that I might, you know, I might be in a different physical setting, but I'm feeling the same anxieties and the same worries that someone in another part of the state is feeling is also a really powerful opportunity to connect to people. So I don't, I don't expect that I'm telling you anything that you don't already know. But I think when, when we have the chance to, to reinforce that message with our colleagues across the state, as much in, in urban as in rural areas, um, it, we, we all bear some responsibility and, and have an opportunity to seize that, to, to reach out to people. Um, and, and we also can, can play important roles in making those connections. Um, you and I are privileged to know people in different parts of the state. And I, one of the best things I like doing, even in, in COVID times, is, is to say to someone, hey, you really ought to meet so-and-so in another part of the state. And, and maybe this is one of the few silver linings of COVID. You don't have to travel out there. You can get on the phone or you can get on a Zoom meeting and make that connection virtually. And then it'll be there uh, when we get to the other side of this and, and can, we can solidify those even more by showing up in person. Thanks for that. And um, yeah, that travel aspect. Uh, my dog misses the traveling, but I sometimes enjoy sleeping more in my own bed. But um, sure. if, um, but let's just run, jump to, into the brass tacks of it. What are some of the things that you have done in the past uh, four years or are working on now to help strengthen uh, rural communities and economies or um, you know, rural families? Yes, I know some of these things uh, apply across the state, as you mentioned, but are there specific programs or what specifically have you done to focus on rural communities? Yeah, the, the, I, would, I would point to a couple. One is um, the, the ABLE program. It's a, um, very much like the college savings plan, but it's aimed specifically at people who are living with disabilities. And it's a savings program that really matters for, um, for people who are struggling because many of those folks are reliant on, on federal or state benefit programs that have an asset test limit in them. So if someone accumulates more than $2,000, they jeopardize their eligibility for that benefit program. Well, the good news is that that asset test limit does not apply to, uh, to, five, to 529, to ABLE uh, savings plans. And so it's a new uh, program, and it is even more important in, in rural areas where there are less services and less access uh, to supports. So we've taken a really deliberate approach, uh, a really grassroots approach uh, to going to those communities. Again, now it's, now it's virtual rather than physical. Um, to make sure that those families uh, know about that, that opportunity. The same uh, kind of uh, disconnect exists when it comes to uh, retirement savings. Uh, half of people in Oregon who are working don't have access to a, a, um, a retirement savings plan at work. 
So Oregon Saves responds specifically to that. And amongst uh, women, amongst people of color, amongst rural communities, there's even more uh, of a need. So we've been uh, working now for, for three years um, to improve that access and open up that possibility to people, uh, in, particularly in rural communities. Uh, we have 75,000 Oregonians now who have funded retirement savings accounts. And together they've saved um, upwards of, of $70 million. Um, that's, that's not enough to retire on yet, but it puts them on, on a path to financial resilience. And in the short term, uh, because these accounts are Roth IRAs, um, they're available for use as, uh, as emergency funds. And in a time like this, that's been really important as well. The other piece um, is in, in debt capacity, making sure that the legislature is making good use of, of that, uh, that capacity and that capital uh, for the kinds of uh, for the kinds of projects that have widely dispersed benefits over long periods of time, especially right now when unemployment is is way too high and interest rates are very nearly zero over the long run, this is the time to invest in the kinds of infrastructure that's going to serve uh, serve communities all over the state, um, and that can make an even bigger impact uh, in rural communities where the state can play an even even more influential role. Yeah, that's huge. And as you hear from every rural Oregonian, um, uh, rural broadband is really big. And especially yep. as near dear to my heart, um, I serve on the Jefferson County uh, Education Service District Board and, and trying to help school boards address um, uh, virtual learning for our kids when it's such a huge barrier. But uh, related to that, and this is a huge one on so many minds of anyone who's working um, is part of an ESD or a school board is the, the question of PERS and the, the challenge that's faced uh, with, with PERS. How do we, um, what steps are you taking or what's your philosophy on how we both um, you know, take care of our educators and our kids not now and into the future? And how are, how, what role does the state treasurer uh, play in, in the PERS discussion? And what's your, your philosophy and, and what are you doing uh, to address the challenge we face? I want to say one other thing on, on rural uh, broadband just before I get to the first question, because the fires are also um, really revealing how, how different and essential this is. When we get a chance to, to rebuild things, um, we should not just assume that we're going to build back just the way it was. And everybody's got to recognize, particularly, as you said, in the education sector, that, that broadband is not a luxury. It's a necessity, both for education and for economic development, everything else. So there are some opportunities there, uh, there as well. As it relates to PERS, um, this might be the most um, misunderstood aspect of the treasurer's role. Um, our job is to generate returns. The conversation about how the program is structured, how it's administered is a worthy one. That's not in the treasurer's uh, responsibility. And I, I have opinions as a former legislator and as an Oregonian on that, which I'm happy to share, but our core responsibility is generating those returns. And in fact, the, one of the worst things for a treasurer to do would be to get distracted by the political battles that have been going on for a long time and, and not deliver on, on the return mandate. That would make the problem worse. So you know, if there were easy solutions uh, that are legal and effective, we would have done them. My role right now uh, is to continue to generate returns. And we're doing really well at that. Oregonians should feel reassured that, that the Public Employee Retirement Fund in Oregon is consistently among the very best performing when you compare it to our peers across the country. How do we do that? Um, we've taken a little bit of a, of a contrary approach relative to some of our peers. And over the long run, it means that we are not going to be the highest of the high in those, in those up markets but we are also not gonna be the lowest of the low in the bear markets. And over time that adds up because it's harder uh, to, to make up losses than it is if you, um, you, know, if you shave off the peaks and, and look more like rolling hills than the, than the Swiss Alps. We've de-risked the portfolio in recent years without giving up those returns. Uh, we're a really global and sophisticated investor. So we have uh, lots of uncorrelated assets. We invested in every asset class and every geography. Uh, we've also worked really hard to pull our expenses down. And, and we do that um, by insourcing work. It turns out, and not to no great surprise, um, that it's less expensive to hire talent in Tigard than it is in Manhattan. And for some significant portions of our portfolio, that's appropriate. Not for all of them, but where we can, we do that. And we've, uh, we've added $500 million in additional, of additional pension fund capital by those those approaches, that adds up. We're also trying to put individual um, 
uh, participants and the fund in a stronger position. So this again is a little bit nerdy, but uh, there's a defined contribution portion of the pension um, known as the individual account program that operates more like a 401k in the private sector where contributions come from uh, individual employees and the risk is on, on them. Um, until recently, that portion of the, of the pension uh, was invested alongside the defined benefit portion. And that's bad because that means the hypothetical 62 year old has exactly the same exposure as the hypothetical 27 year old. And you can, you can easily see why that would be bad. So we went through a pretty uh, elaborate effort to, uh, to move those, uh, those individual account um, balances to a suite of target date funds. That means that automatically the risk adjusts as a person gets closer to retirement. That, older person then has less risk. That obviously is good for them as they're less exposed to an ill-timed market uh, uh, disruption, but it's also good for the fund because it lessens the chance of a, of a run on the fund at, at exactly the wrong time, which might force us to sell it at a discount. So those are, those are important things. And I know we're really getting in the weeds here and detailed stuff, but this is, this is the kind of thing that we do in the treasurer's office. I'm not the guy who's gonna be out there tweeting about this stuff. I'm going to be quietly behind the scenes getting the work done. And I, I don't think that people should, um, you know, should, should confuse uh, productive leadership with tweeting. We see that in the White House these days. Uh, and that's, that's not getting us where we need to go. We could go, I could go for a long time on, on this, but I, I feel like I, I might be uh, putting, putting your uh, loyal and dedicated viewers to sleep if I, if I do. So I'll stop there. Well, I, I very much appreciate your in-depth knowledge and your, your commitment, knowledge of the subject matter and your thoughtfulness of it. I'm getting to see now why your team insisted you throw an ax instead of give a whole description of, because that probably, that might've gone better on Facebook, just, just saying. No, yeah. but it's, I, no, I, it's in sincerity, I greatly appreciate it. And, and two things, actually one fo uh, thing in a follow-up, really appreciate also the investment in that person working in Tigard. Um, you know, how we, we put our money where our mouth is and investing in Oregonians and building up that, um, the skills and that resource within our state is really important. Uh, too often we hear the talk and then see investments um, of our resources outside the state, which, which is, yes, we need the, the, the best mind, the best resources, but that investment in in-house is, is much appreciated. And a, a follow-up question though, are there, in terms of investments, are there things that you choose not to invest in? And it makes me think of divestment back when there was the Krugerrand from South Africa and the pressure put on the apartheid government. Are there decisions that your office makes in ter that, may be, um, that may be arguably more, uh, bring in some returns, but that there's a decision that that's not where we wanna put our, our taxpayer dollars? It's a really astute question, and it's going to take a little nuanced answer, uh, as usual. But um, the first thing to got a bunch of questions, let me say. So if it's good, yeah, good, I'll be I'll be as quick as I can. The the thing to remember here is that these are not public dollars. That also is is often misunderstood. These are dollars that belong to retirees. So we cannot substitute our own judgment as as intensely and unanimously as we might feel it uh, for those decisions. That's from a you know an Oregonian values motivated sort of person, the bad news. But the good news is that in many many cases our values and our fiduciary obligations line up. The key is when we think about the very long run. So you have to make the argument that um, participation with a, a company. Let's, say, let's take two companies: one that is thinking about climate disruption and one that's not. We have to be able to say we're going to go there because that's going to make them more successful in the long run, not because it's the right moral thing to do, even though we probably think that. Um, that gives us room to do a lot of that stuff. We're not generally fans of saying uh, we're going to divest from all of X. Um, we're more fans of taking the individual decision um, on individually and looking for the long run interests of the fund and our, and our beneficiaries. Well, this, this speaks to a question. I think you've answered it, but I just want to um, ask sure. it directly. You received from, from someone uh, listening in from uh, Jennifer K. So um, she said that now that Oregon's last coal-fired plant has closed, are there plans to divest from funds that include fossil fuel companies? It's, it sounds like it, the answer is no. Well, it's, it's a little more complicated than that because the question of you know, exposure to fossil fuels, I mean, we're all exposed to it in one way or another. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we have good data on how, how exposure impacts returns. And there is a lot of good work on that. We're, we're 
integrating those decisions in it, it, those processes and those data into our decisions. And I think we are making, we, you know, we doubled our, our investments in clean and renewable energy. Um, we're looking for those opportunities um, to be active investors. Um, when we own shares in a company that's not doing well, that gives us the chance to cast our votes for their board, uh, to, to, to require them to do things. And we've done that in at least two specific examples uh, with Exxon Mobil. Um, but you know, we're, we're likely to have exposure to things that we don't like because one of the ways we invest is in passive, in, uh, passive vehicles, in index funds, those sorts things. So I don't think it's reasonable to say at some point we're going to have zero exposure to that. But by being an active investor, by, by exerting our influence, we can hopefully um, turn some of those companies um, to, to good things. And you know, it's likely as we, as we improve technology that one of those companies is going to play a role. So, so we'd also like to participate in that upside too. Thank you for that. Um, another question that's related to infrastructure. You're ta um, you're talking earlier about the the investment of resources, and this actually comes from Jerry Allen, who's a state senate district two candidate um, and a former Great. pension fund trustee. And he's actually uh, going to be we're going to be talking to him next week, actually. Great. But he asked about the possibility of Oregon issuing green infrastructure development bonds. Is that something that you've thought of, or something we could do? Yes, um, and we have. In fact, it's a it's a question. This is one of those ones that's. Um, uh, a, a branding sort of question because the term gets thrown around and a lot of different uh, um, issuers mean different things by them. It's a little bit like lead certification in the world of, of bonding. Uh, it, it, so what we've done uh, three times now is say, here are our sustainability bonds. And this is what it means for us. In, in our case, all three of them have been uh, for affordable housing. The result has been really encouraging because it's generated significantly more interest uh, amongst lenders uh, to the tune of three or four times over subscription, that means that we pay less and that we can put more of those dollars to work in affordable housing. The, the legislature retains the, the authorization for you know, what, what are we going to bond for, but we definitely make that case um, that we can make them go farther when we do things that fit into those categories. Great, thank you. And then let's go back. We touched on this a little bit earlier. I want to ask you specifically about uh, steps you've taken or your office has taken to address some of the institutionalized discrimination that now is getting much more attention. It's been there, but it's now getting much more attention. Um, and you know, in your role as state treasurer, uh, some of the things, this actually ties into a couple of the questions that we've received um, uh, from folks listening in. Um, and this is specific also to supporting, uh, in this case, the, the, the person asking is, is talking about supporting uh, uh, democratic rural candidates, but but even broader than that, what um, people, emerging leaders from BIPOC communities, and so those who don't know, so Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color communities, what steps, uh, tangible steps have you taken in your office, either past or you're planning now, to actually help uh, support and, and overcome the, the history of institutionalized racism we have in our state, uh, a very painful past. What steps have you taken or are you taking to address this? Thank you for asking this because there's one really specific thing that I would love some help on uh, from rural candidates. Uh, so here, here's a place that uh, uh, I got really frustrated with as a, as a legislator, and now I've got the chance to do something about it. The college savings plan, which has existed for a long time uh, in the treasurer's office, um, does not reflect Oregon. The people who tend to use it are overwhelmingly affluent white folks from, from metro areas. So I started looking into this as a legislator, but as treasurer, we've been able to take a, a really deliberate step uh, to, to improve this. And what we discovered is there's two main reasons that, that this is the case. One is people don't know about the college savings plan, but the other is that the tax incentive is pretty irrelevant for a lot of people. It, we've had a tax deduction for a long time, and that's fine if you're among the fortunate few who get to itemize your deductions. But in Jim Tankersley, another Oregonian who's at the New York Times reported a couple of weeks ago, only one in 10 filers right now are, are itemizing. So we went to the legislature and became the first state in the country to move from a tax deduction to a refundable tax credit for contributions in the college savings plans, like the uh, political tax credit many people are familiar with. So if you make a contribution, you'll get it back in the form of a, a bigger tax refund or a smaller tax bill. And we went further by making it progressive. So it's dollar for dollar for the lowest income Oregonians. And this matters because a child who has a college savings account, no matter how much is in it, is three times as likely to go to college, four times as likely to graduate. And that, by the way, is a pretty broad definition. So it's not just universities, but it's community colleges, it's trade schools, it's apprenticeship programs. And I want to make sure that every Oregon kid has a clear message from the state that we believe they are capable and worthy and we have expectations of them. 
So this is a this is a message that I hope rural candidates can 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 deliver to people in, in rural parts of the state. But it goes further. So we like this so much that we put our some of our own money um, to uh, to work here. Um, if someone opens an account for an Oregon born baby before their first birthday, we will put twenty five dollars in that account. Now, twenty five dollars probably doesn't sound like all that much, but I wish that I could get these kinds of returns on the rest of our investments. We'd spent about $100,000 on those initial deposits. And in the year that followed, we saw additional contributions into those accounts of $12 million. So just getting people started has been a really powerful thing. So much success there that we've extended that baby grad program to a pretty self-explanatory kinder grad program. So please, all you rural folks, help us deliver that message to people around the state. I could go on about the great work we're doing about our own staff, um, integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion work into the investment process as well. But uh, I really want to emphasize that education savings credit, the college savings plan. Well, let me, um, so I think that's a, that's a great program, but let me just push back on that a little bit. Um, speaking as someone who uh, graduated from high school in, here in Oregon, in Southern Oregon, and my mom was an educator, but we were pretty much, um, it was virtually hand to mouth because our educators are not, are not sometimes very adequately um, uh, supported a resource. It, some families, like my family, I was growing up, didn't have the resources to, um, to invest. And so if that's the case, and to the point you've made that if it's primarily more affluent people who are investing and essentially taking advantage of these public funds, um, either what's being done or do we have a program in place that's actually just um, uh, benefiting wealthy people? Not anymore. Um, what we did was to change that. Um, first, well, first off, higher education needs to be more affordable. Full stop. Uh, and that's a that's a good and rich conversation. That's that's slightly different. But what we've done to create the education savings credit is to reduce the expense of the existing tax deduction on the high end and redirect it to the lower end. So, and and we've put. There's there's twenty five dollars right off the top that no one has to um, you know to come up with on their own for someone who you know can open that account in the first year or in a kindergarten um, year, um, but again this is like the college savings plans so even you know whatever you can scrape together over the course of the year you'll get it back and if you can do that once you'll get it back put it back in the account it can be the re revolving deposit going forward so I, I'm by no means uh, suggesting that this is the end uh, or that we don't have more work to do but to move from this situation where it, it has been uh, over you know over represented amongst uh, affluent white metro folks to having a tool or, or a suite of tools that allow us to go to communities that don't have this tradition um, that really makes the difference and again it's not about the amount that's in it's about the fact that the kid knows that there's an account that's someone's investing in me so i've got expectations there's there you know there's there's potential for me so um we could go on and on about that but i really feel strongly in this in this investment and the, and the signaling um we're doing is really putting compound interest at their back uh, rather than potentially holding them back with debt um and that's a that's a really powerful thing it is and i appreciate and first of all i i apologize my dog just did a, a little photo well. bomb <laughs> drop in but um you know, it, it is it is incredibly powerful. The the question is, it comes down to sometimes families even having that twenty five bucks to put forward, and they don't have. To. That's what we're doing at the beginning. So twenty five bucks to get them started in the um, in the kindergarten year and in the first year of birth. Um, I, I want to do more than that, but these were significant steps forward, and I think with the, with the results that we're we're showing, we'll be able to do more over time. Yeah, no, I I, I appreciate. It. I guess my point is, um, you know, that that point of folks struggling of not even having those small funds to to put into, um, and 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 making sure we're not losing those kids and those families. Um, the other thing is. Uh, also to, to challenge back. And I really appreciate the, the, the program and how it's evolved. And now it seems like the next step will also be to just, um, what does the data show? Does the data show that communities are being served or not being served? And then a, a follow-up question that came up on this was in terms of challenging uh, our, our rural candidates and, and, and folks, especially rural BIPOC community folks to embrace this program. The question was, um, have you done the outreach and do you know who some of these folks are? Who are, are these voices in the community? Um, yeah, so it's an important point. And, and we recognize that, that we, particularly me, 
Uh, I'm not I'm not the person to do that. Uh, I don't have the relationships. I don't have the credibility. So we've been working very hard with with uh, with folks who do have those relationships, do have those connections to to be uh, to be the messenger. We don't we don't need to be at the front. We need to give them the tools and the and the uh, resources to do that. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. And I think what's being called out is uh, now we're, it's, you know, the first step is always realizing there's that gap. And now how are we actually taking the steps to, to address it and build those relationships and get that, get that word out. And so, you know, continuous improvement. It's a, it's a, but, but I think it's a, a fair call on this one. Let's, um, let's go from a tough topic to another tough topic. Uh, sure. the, the conversation touched before on our changing climate. It's considered to be the greatest threat uh, to the next generation. Um, one of your roles as state treasurers be one of the three who sits on the state land board. Um, so a project that has, uh, you know, the state land board has received a lot of attention in the past couple of years because of a major project that's come through and there's different permitting processes, but it's essentially a natural gas pipeline that would um, go through Oregon to the coast um, and, and Oregon would essentially be a conduit for, for uh, natural gas, which would be sold over to uh, China and result in greenhouse gas emissions. So um, yes, there would be jobs associated with the construction of it and for the, the terminal um, out at Coos Bay. Um, but there's also a lot of concerns about the climate impact. So a very controversial issue throughout our state and especially in Southern Oregon, um, uh, where I've got a lot of family and friends down that area. So um, the question has come up, what are your thoughts on the LNG project? And do you, um, how can the state land board uh, help to better manage our resources, our public resources? Yeah, so two, two related, but, but slightly different questions too. And the first thing is, you know, the, the, the first time I encountered this, um, this question was as a legislator. Um, and in those days, the proposal was for an LNG export facility uh, I'm sorry, import, now export. And so that's just a, a, an interesting commentary on how the world energy uh, can change uh, quickly. So I've tried to keep a, a long-term perspective on these things. And obviously with the change in administrations, the change in ownership of the project, there's always something new that's happening. So I, I would not even uh, contend that as we sit here today, I have perfect knowledge of the current status because you know, a, a, uh, a permit gets uh, revoked or, or we signal that it's about to get uh, uh, rejected and they pull the permit and start over again. So it's hard to keep track of where it is at every moment. So I think my role in, in the land board is to do everything we can to make sure that, that our processes with the Department of State Lands are legitimate and, um, and, and well run. Um, the permit that, that the department might issue is, is but one of a whole bunch. Um, so we need to make sure that that's done well and appropriately and on firm legal ground and all the rest of it. The piece that I also worry about uh, is, is from the other part of, of the land board's responsibility for those, those lands and submerged lands. And I, I draw on an experience we had over the last couple of years in another part of the state where there was a, a derelict vessel in the, in the Columbia River Channel that someone had left behind. And the land board is, has to pick up the cost. In that case, it was $12 million to clean up this derelict vessel. So when we talk about um, Jordan Cove, that weighs on my mind to think about if it were to go forward, if it were uh, to uh, clear all those other hurdles, how do we assure that, that the state is adequately protected in the you know, terrible uh, likelihood that, that, or unlikelihood um, that something bad happened and the, and the company is gone? Are we adequately protected? That's one small piece of it, but it's one that as the fiduciary, I, try, I think about a lot. Um, that's, that's setting aside all the other legitimate questions about uh, whether it's appropriate. But it also is emblematic of the approach we try to take, or at least I try to take in the land board in bringing a multidisciplinary sort of uh, consideration to things. The other, um, the other example that we've uh, spent a lot of time on and gotten a lot of attention for is the Elliott State Forest. Uh, and you know, I came into a discussion that was already underway um, and was asked to, you know, in my first meeting to reject a proposal that the previous land board had had already begun uh, without, in my view, a viable alternative. Um, so really trying to, to maintain the possibility to create that alternative. And though it's a process that probably no one would have designed as it, as it played out, I'm really proud of where we are now on the cusp of transforming the Elliott into a research forest at Oregon State University and meeting our obligations to the Common School Fund. And so that, I guess that's part of the, the answer to the second part of your question uh, around how I try to take these questions on with, with a lot more 
creativity and collaboration and an eye on the long run. Um, the, the pressure is, is often really specific, but um, to, have, to have that approach around um, creativity and collaboration, I think serves as well. I, I appreciate uh, the, the general approach. I'll also just um, flag in terms of the relationships that, that you mentioned, uh, specific relationship with the tribes as well. I, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to have a conversation about the LNG with um, uh, tribal chairman, uh, Don Gentry. And he raised not just the environmental impacts of not the long-term, just climate change uh, impacts of uh, use of natural gas, but also, of course, impact to, to streams and potential wildfire and all these others, as well as uh, the historic record of when pipelines are developed that um, uh, indigenous women are often targeted by, and, and this is just historical data that's been provided in, from past record. And so that protection of folks in our community, um, yes, it, it, it doesn't necessarily rise to the level of some of the technical conversation that happened, but it part of our partnership, part of our community, and I would just uh, I would just flag that for for mm -hmm. future uh, consideration yep. as well. Yep. Um, speaking of fires, and let me ask one more question before I want to wrap up and just ask you a little bit about some of the stuff you're doing now. Sure. So uh, Stella asked uh, about both the pandemic, COVID, which has hit us all, and of course the the wildfires that have devastated parts of our state. Yeah. Um, in you know, Sentiem Pass and in Southern Oregon, other parts of the state as well along the coast. Yeah. Um, many of us have, you know, family and friends have lost homes. Um, so the, the, fire, the pandemic fires have hit us really hard. Uh, as state treasurer, in your capacity as state treasurer, what can you do and what will you do to help Oregonians recover? Well, the governor asked me and Labor Commissioner Val Hoyle to co-chair Wildfire Economic Recovery Council. We've met twice so far, and we've begun to take these questions on in, in essentially three buckets. Uh, one is around cleanup, specifically. One is around housing, and one is around the, the longer-term uh, rebuilding and, and um, uh, recovery kind of efforts. So I think that's a decent way of, of thinking of the structure. Uh, we're also trying to think about each of those buckets in very short term and, and longer term implications. Um, we have some tools at, at Treasury that I'm sure we will be asked to provide and, and we'll do that uh, in terms of our expertise around bonding, in terms of some of the interfund borrowing uh, capacity that we have. Um, but we have to do that in a way that recognizes that there are very different needs in different communities and consistent with the where our conversation started the structure is built on on a series of regional teams that report out to the to the statewide council on uh, what they are seeing and what their particular needs are so uh, I, and this also connects to the conversation we had earlier about broadband. Um, we don't have to just build back exactly what was there before. Uh, we're having the beginning stages of really interesting conversations about what opportunities does this present um, to put those communities in a stronger position uh, against future fires and other challenges. Um, so there's there. It's hard to think of positive things out of, out of a wildfire, but um, there may be some of those uh, as we get a chance to, uh, to think about what should be done better uh, going forward. Thank you for that. And then just another thing to flag on that, of course, uh, some folks are talking about some not, but the vulnerable com communities whose voices yeah. aren't necessarily at the table. So we saw that especially yeah. in Talent Phoenix, where you have some family members uh, who may not, who may have an undocumented family member. So either are not eligible for FEMA funds or feel at risk stepping forward and giving that information. So are our, our, you calling that out? We have, we have yeah. specifically and intentionally and repeatedly raised that in our two meetings and we're not, we're not gonna lose sight of that. Great because that's part of our Oregon family and, and yep. we don't want to leave family members behind on that. Right. Thank you for this discussion. I want to just, um, you know, so you're talking about the role and the things you've done in, in your role as, as a treasurer, state treasurer, and also some of the, the, your work in the legislature before that, but you're also a candidate this year. So what are some of the issues that have come up and what's your vision going forward for Oregon? Well, a lot of what we I talked about today, um, and I feel like I feel really good about the consistent record of achievement and, and steadiness that we've accumulated in our first uh, four years, and I, I hope to continue doing that. Um, it's for me, it's about trying to leave Oregon and Oregonians in a stronger financial position, and that that ranges from the continued professionalization and modernization of our internal operations, uh, our investment programs, our bonding offerings, uh, to, to to the to the continued integration of environmental, social, and governance factors 
structures into our processes um, to, to rolling out these, these tools um, to Oregon families from, from ABLE to the college savings plan to Oregon saves or retirement savings plan. Um, all of these things are, are important to, to the full financial picture of the state. And I think especially in times like this, when the pace of change is just so exhausting, when uh, things might look really different going forward, we don't, we don't know the depth nor the duration of, of the pandemic. We don't know the, the long-term implications of, of the fires and how that's all going to turn out. It's increasingly important to have someone uh, in the treasurer's office who has, uh, has that eye on the, on the horizon uh, beyond the, the choppy seas in front of us. Um, for me, the, the themes are really about opportunity, equity, and, and resilience, and that's going to continue to be the case for me. Uh, my big worry um, in this environment is that um, these offices uh, at the, in the middle of the ballot uh, can be forgotten now. I hope they're, they're filling them out entirely before they return them. Well, and up and down the ballot, because yep. we're actually going to be having a conversation with city Absolutely. council uh, candidates on Sunday, because a lot of folks either dream at the federal level and, and also at the state level. There's a lot of attention. And frankly, parties tend to, um, both parties tend to fall in the habit of um, trying to drum up support from their respective party without uh, focusing on some of those local issues uh, that we've been talking about today. And, and that I know from the last couple of years of, of meeting with you and kind of, you know, asking you about geeky little specific issues about how communities can be addressed. You're always, I know you're always one who steps forward and very interested and very thoughtful about how that can be applied and how we can be working in our communities. Uh, lastly, uh, just before we wrap up, how do people learn more about you? To your point of, of people not learning, uh, not knowing much about um, either you as a candidate or about uh, the treasurer's office, what's your website? It's TobiasReed.com, uh, and as you can see behind me, it's uh, it's read like read a book. Uh, I think we also redirect from R E E D, but uh, they have one of those names that can be spelled multiple ways. Uh, we're on Twitter, Tobias Reed, uh, Instagram as well, and and people who are uh, who are overachievers, um, text me please three eight four seven zero. Text my my last name. It's good practice to just read uh, to that number, and and we'll keep in touch with you that way. Okay, well, I'll ask some folks uh, who are helping us out if they can put that in the chat box. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Um, I know you're super busy. We really appreciate the time to, to talk with us about some of the things that are you're doing um, uh, throughout Oregon. Um, and um, also just want to tell folks, you know, this November, it's an incredibly important election. Uh, ballots are in the mail. Those of us who are not in uh, urban areas don't yet have our ballots. Uh, hopefully we'll have them by this weekend, but this is a really critical time to step up, uh, learn more about the candidates and don't, um, you know, don't be shy about uh, learning more and holding all our candidates to a high standard and really uh, voting for the person who's going to really serve our community best and our state best and our country best. Um, you know, ballot, like I said, ballots are in the mail, be an informed voter and get your ballots in early. Either mail them in because uh, postage is paid for this year. Make sure to sign them. Make sure don't swap them and put them in the wrong envelope. All that stuff will delay and potentially allow your, your ballot to be pushed back and challenged. So do it right. Get your ballot in as soon as possible and make sure your voice is heard because your voice is your vote. And your vote is your voice. I turn that around. Your vote is your voice and your voice is incredibly important right now. So again, uh, Tobias Reed, thank you for joining us. And uh, everyone, get out there and vote. Thanks very much. Thanks.